Rafi, I think you can see the screen right now. Okay. Can yep. get started. Um, so, bishop versus knight, yeah? So, generally, the other rules of the knight end games or the bishop end games, they still stand in bishop versus knight. So, basically, whenever the pawns are on both sides of the board, so separated, and it's like a race between the pawns. So, let's say in this position, black will pick up this pawn, and let's say white will try to promote his edge pawn. So, in these upcoming races, uh, the side with the bishop usually benefits, yeah? Right. So, like, like for example, uh, hypothetically speaking, let's say Black picks this up, and then he has another defensive task to go and stop the edge pawn. So, Black will have to instantly, like, you know, start moving his knight, yeah? That he needs to go to c4, e5, g4, h6, and then stop the pawn. So, he mm -hmm. does not have any time to waste, basically. Uh, the bishop, however, is a different thing. I mean, you can allow the black pawn to come to a2 and still come back, yeah, bishop b1. Yeah. So, whenever there is this pawn race situation, the knight is usually not that great. And, and another additional tip is whenever it's the cornered pawn, the knight struggles even more. Because yeah, does not have a lot of squares, yeah, to capture the corner pawn. So, it's always a big problem. Okay, having mm -hmm. said that, I mean, of course, there are also some uh, defensive abilities, but I just wanted to go through the theory. Um, another thing is we we say that whenever you are playing with knights and pawns, uh, and knights and bishops, I mean, so if there is a file difference or a file gap between pawn islands, it's good for the bishop. So, for, for example, in this position, you can see between these two pawns, uh, there is one file gap, yeah? Yeah. So, it will prefer to the bishop side. But, however, if you remove these two pawns as well, so the difference between between the F pawn and the C pawn is like two files right now. Uh -huh. uh, here, the bishop becomes even more powerful. If the uh, bishop becomes more powerful, if there's a gap, you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah. The the wider the gap, the bishop becomes more and more powerful. Okay. Why why do you think that is? Uh, because the knight will not have a lot of free central squares, yeah? The bishop will be better at keeping the knight at bay, basically, if there's gaps between the pawns. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes exactly. Like, there are some situations. Like, let's just say in this position, black wants to come to the king side, yeah? So he can come by playing knight e5, right? But let's just imagine yeah, if these two pawns were not there and somehow yeah. white manages to put his king on d5 or f5 somewhere, then the knight has even no means to come to the king side. Like it cannot even use a square to come to the king side. Okay. So this is just general rule that uh, this is actually more appropriate when we are playing a position with double bishops versus knight and bishop. At that time, this becomes even more valid. Like the more the gap between the pawns, the side of the bishop gets stronger. Okay, I understand. Okay, so so let's let's have a look at this position. Um, um, it's white to play. So how do you think, Rafi? White should make like what should be white's plan in this position?
so without like much calculation and without like you know um just just like intuitive feelings you can also tell okay well just start pushing the h pawn and hmm? try to get that you know as far down the board as possible and try to use the bishop to try to you know keep that knight mm -hmm. out of the play as much as possible maybe bishop needs to go on some type of like f5 or something mm -hmm. and then the h pawn needs to run and um one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Also, watch out for the king. So, you know, just need to make sure that the king can't come up and just win the pawn. But I think if bishop goes on h5 and pawn goes on h7, then I think that structure is somewhat stable ish. Mm hmm. <clears throat> So I think we should start with H4, yeah? Right, definitely. So I think this is a very good way of uh, defense. I mean, defense as in, we don't want to waste time by defending the A pawn, yeah? It's pointless, actually. So, like, our, our pushing our pawn is obviously the priority here. Okay, black response with knight um, E5. All right, so now we need to come to um, F5, Bishop F5. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> Well, um, let's see what's going on here. I'll play King F2. Bishop B4. Perfect. So this completely traps the knight. Yep. And Thanks to the spawn, King G3 wins next move, yeah? Yeah. So even if he plays this, we can use that. The spawn is out of reach now. Yes. I actually missed that night fork, by the way. I, I, honestly, I didn't see that. Um, so, <laughs> but after you played it, then I figured out the idea. Mm -hmm. Actually, I should tell you that uh, allowing forks is fine, but um, basically the thing is, when the knight is defending, Sometimes we have to look for these tricks, yeah, that he can give a check and gain access to another square, which might be seeming, you know, not so possible. Like, like for example, yeah, let's just say in this situation, uh, you spotted the check, right, which is happening here. And you obviously want to move your bishop. So you will say, okay, let me play bishop e4. But this will allow knight g4. Yeah. And then this pawn is under attack plus... So this square is under defense. So right. black gets like a dark square control here. And that means you will need your king right now to push the pawn to h6. Yeah. So this means additional, like let's say one, maybe even two, three, four moves. And then only you can start pushing. And right. we are we are not very sure yeah, what black can achieve on, with, with those four moves, right? He might try to make some progress here. He might try to bring his king here in four moves, you know. Right. So, <clears throat> so it's better to like, I mean, uh, the speed should be the priority. So, that's that's how it should work. But yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> obviously unfortunate that you missed knight f three, but bishop f five is the correct move. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So here, bishop was superior, and we will directly go to uh, this next position, which is a. Uh, classic example of how sometimes people don't realize that the bishop can be superior. So this game was played by one of my students uh, in the Qatar Masters. So my student was playing from black and it is black to play here. So you can actually see that black is up upon in this situation. 
But uh, from the drawback side, uh, Black's A5 pawn is hanging. Uh, all the knight is like quite well placed. Uh, it does not have like enough targets right now. But still, it's a good knight. And Black's king is a bit stuck yeah, on A8. Yeah. So in, in this position, uh, my student took the decision of playing rook c5 here. So he did not want to give up the a pawn and decided to trade rooks. This decision is, I mean, probably logical because you don't want to just give it up. But you have to be super careful before making such decisions because this is the last moment when black at least can take knight f4. And let's just say rook c6, yeah. And this should be easily drawn, right? Uh, from the black perspective? Yeah, from black's perspective. Like black can draw this? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, it's like equal pawns and black has no weaknesses. I mean, if I just put my rook on c7, you can't even take any pawns, yeah? Mm -hmm. And this is only the defensive aspect. I can obviously try for some of my own counterplay as well. Yeah. But I, I just don't think there is any risk of uh, losing this position. Yeah, yeah, there's not. Last moment, and I, I mean, I'm not saying black is actually winning. It's It should be an equal position. But black has no chances of losing this one. But uh, my student here played rook c5, and after bishop e3, uh, rook b5, cb5, the position suddenly changes, yeah? And now black has to deal with a weakness on a5 plus this weird king entry, yeah? I mean, after the knight moves. Yeah, and then f2 is protected by the bishop too on top of that, right? After and bishop is stopping all those pawns. You can't even move the pawns. Exactly. So this is known as the principle of one diagonal. It's a... It's a like an endgame theory we learn when we do bishop versus the pawns endgame. Uh, in, in, in that endgame, basically it's explained that uh, sometimes your opponent might have multiple pawns, but the bishop can just stop them over one diagonal. Which is why the bishops of opposite color is usually draw, right? Because of this scenario right here a yes. lot of times. Yes. Mm-hmm. So in this situation, uh, I mean, as the game proceeded, I mean, uh, the computer still believes that this position can be drawn with some super accurate play, but white is obviously pressing. Uh, but as the game proceeded, um, so we just like witnessed that, sorry, the game went king b8, bishop b6, king c8, and there were, actually, I'll just go to the game and just show you the upcoming position here. So king c4, king b8, bishop b6, knight d3, king d5. And, and you can see here, yeah, white is gaining access to the king side now. So this, this actually makes the defensive task for black way more difficult, yeah? It seems like it's pretty much impossible. Yeah, it, it, it is actually very, very, I mean, maybe with some very accurate play, there might be some defensive chances, but it's not easy to spot any of those. Yeah, I don't even know how. Like, the king is just coming straight down. Yeah. Black's <laughs> king is completely out of play. Mm -hmm. A5 is definitely gone, right? The knight can't even take on F2. Yeah. Like a disaster for, for Black. Yeah, exactly. So basically, the the point here, yeah, you remember I told you, when the gap between the pawns is like a lot of files, it's usually beneficial. Yeah. So see, this is the point. If you consider the two pawn islands, the distance is like three files now. So it will take a lot of time for the knight to attack f2 and b5. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It cannot simultaneously attack them. So, I mean, what I'm saying is, let's say black plays this. And we reach a position like this, yeah? I don't have to mm -hmm. worry about B5 or F2 anymore. I can just proceed with my usual plan. Because you will waste like two moves to attack F2. And I can defend with, with one. 
Now again, to attack b5, you will need three moves. I can again defend it with one. So basically, when you when you play now knight b2, knight a4, I can again go back bishop a5, yeah? And take care of the c3 square. So with every move, white is gaining access to the king side and white's position just gets better and better, yeah, with every move. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think we can, I mean, it's actually pretty safe to say that the decision of playing rook c5 itself was the losing moment in this game. Even though the computer feels that after rook c5 still, it's not lost, but I would say from a technical aspect, rook c5 is a mistake. And maybe this is why, like, you need to know these endgames so that you won't even consider rook c5. Like, I'll give you the situation. You can actually see that it's move number 38, right? Right. So uh, the players are trying to reach the 40 move time control. So they are playing in seconds right now, like 30 seconds and less. And they just want to reach the 40 move mark. Yeah? So obviously it's impossible to calculate a lot of things, but the general decision or the general understanding of the position should say that pawns are separated. White's king is more active. So going into a bishop versus knight hardly can be the right idea. Provided, uh, I mean, after, apart from that, you also mentioned that all these pawns are controlled over the same diagonal. So we don't even have uh, the pawn breaks on the king side yet. Yeah? Right. Yeah. So it just looks like a terrible idea to even think and go for rook c5. Like if, if I had 30 seconds and if I had to decide what should I do here, I will just play knight f4. I mean, I, I might even consider playing b6, but never rook c5 in this position. Yeah, I think he should recognize the power of this bishop on these on this on that um c8 c1 to um h6 yeah. diagonal, right? The yeah. fact that all these are pawns in the light squares, they all need to go to the dark square, and that bishop is guarding all those squares, yeah. and the king has this entry that you talked about. Yeah, on yeah. that diagonal, I think that should have been like something that. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, if I was playing a blitz game, I would pretty sure also play rook c five here. But mm -hmm. I think within a long game, I definitely would calculate knight c five right away because, mm -hmm. you know, um, I need to save save those pawns because that king is way too active. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Actually, the thing is, um. We should also not forget that this pawn is fixed on the same color of the bishop, yeah? So that yeah. also is a potential target, right? Right. So whenever, as I said, yeah, whenever the game will be juggling between king side and queen side, the bishop usually becomes the stronger piece. Yeah. These end games with the knight is very difficult. I mean, all the time, for sure. It's, it's, it's difficult to actually hold on. I mean, unless and until you really get lucky with a very nice defensive pattern or something. It's it's always yeah. very tricky. Yeah. But especially apart. the problem here actually is one of the main problems is that is the white king is way too active. Uh yes, I, I agree. I completely has agree. way too many just entry squares very easily. Say for example this position was black king was on E6, I think it'd be a completely different ballgame. Mm, yes. Uh, I think for sure if Black's King was on E6, I mean then probably black will try to win, yeah, because he can try to play king f6 and the g5 f4 breaks. Try to move those pawns here. Yeah. yeah but uh, but without that, uh, it's kind of actually pointless. But but uh, what I also wanted to tell you is that after even after playing such a like not so correct decision, it is actually commendable for white to. Like you can see here, yeah, the moment uh, black played g5, so this is just to keep f4 ready, yeah? White found the move g4. So further separating and making some disruptions in the pawn structure.
Was G4 that difficult to locate though? Because um I mean no because I, I like think, you know no I think I think G4 is a pretty obvious move here. Uh right, because you're gonna isolate that E pawn and take that E pawn first, right? Yes, yes, for sure. I mean I, I think G4 uh, is not a very difficult move in this position. But you know, normally uh since white is trying to enter yeah to this side, probably white would have uh considered king e6 as well so i think uh, what i what i felt was probably black had set up some kind of a trap that he will play f4 this this is just my understanding of the position and some sort of knight f2 might come you know wow really okay maybe this is this is this is i wow. i just thought that Maybe this is this was the intention. Obviously, like upon calculation, I can understand that this can never be correct because I can just play a bishop f2, e3, and just bishop g1. Yeah. So now again the pawns are controlled. Like if you push e2, I'll play bishop f2. And okay, I'll again capture all the pawns. So I'm not exactly sure what exactly what Black had in mind, uh, but I am pretty sure that maybe there is some sort of a draw, like something something was definitely calculated, may, may, because maybe something like this e3, you know, sacrificing, so that when this happens, the knight can go to b2, pick this up. Interesting, yeah. Okay, may, maybe this is an this is an option, but White did not even give all these chances. White just found g4 and. Okay, this is already completely lost because now the king is extremely close and you have to take care of the other side pass pawn right now, yeah? Yeah. So black's king can never be really uh, free here. And, well, the knight cannot defend pawns which are situated on dark squares. So it's just a losing game right now. And e even here... Like you can see, bishop a uh, bishop c five is also pretty nice. So basically, black ran out of moves here and played this, and again. Wait, wait, bishop wait, 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 wait! Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, bishop c five. Oh, he can't take the bit. Okay, okay, I got yeah, you, I got you. He cannot take because of a seven. Right. <laughs> okay. So this this was just an example like from the recent tournament. So I just decided to like you know show this. Uh, Bishop is way stronger here. Yeah, definitely. I can see that. Yeah. So it dominates. So you you can actually see. I mean, I'm just giving you the full <laughs> picture. Like the bishop is in such a way that the knight can't even come to the queen side, even if he wants. Like, let's just say I want the knight on a7 or a8 or something like that. I will have to take a very long route, yeah, to get here. Right, yeah. So it's it's just too much time and okay, that, that just never works. Yeah. This kind of thing typically will work only if it's a bishop knight and maybe like only two pawns are on the board or one pawn. Then you can sack the knight for the pawn and make it a draw. But if there's too many pawns, these kind of end games. As you said, bishops with uh, bishop knight versus bishop with pawns on both sides of the boards are <clears throat> almost impossible for knight to defend. Almost always, very difficult. Uh, yes, practically uh, uh, very difficult, especially in time pressure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, definitely. Actually, that that's that's what was the talking point about this game. You know, so on move number thirty-eight, yeah, when White played rook b five. Um, so you are low on time. Uh, you know that the bishop can be better. Uh, you like all the signs show that the bishop will be better. Plus, your king is very passive. So, the the first move that should come to your mind is knight takes bishop. Yeah, in this situation, it's it's like the first move that you should consider instead of rook c five. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. I want to go to the next position here. So obviously, white is um uh, the 
better side here with two extra pawns, but one of them is like doubled. So these kind of situations also provide some defensive ideas for black because the knight will be a very good close range defender. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask you if if possible, uh, can you try and like find a winning idea for white, like how white should improve from this position? Like whatever you feel, whatever comes to your mind. I think White should just immediately cut off this knight from entry towards those those pawns as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So like bishop c3 type of stuff, then start walking the king, uh, king okay. over there Actually, while the knight is cut off. So this position was black to play, black played knight f6. After this, we have... Okay. To play. Uh, gotcha. If, if it was white to play, I think bishop c3 yeah, makes sense. Maybe try to keep it out of G4, the knight out of getting into G4. So maybe I would play F3. Okay. So black will just waste time, yeah, let's say. So knight D5. So bishop D2 is forced. It's going to make mm -hmm. that and okay, king E7. Okay, so what, what is your plan next? I mean, moves, obviously, I think we can play any move and white will be fine. And probably the evaluation won't change. But we should have a plan, yeah, like how to convert this position into a win. So, I think um, we should get rid of these double pawns and just try to create an uh, outside pass pawn on the H file, pass pawn. Maybe yeah. consider playing F5. And then once that happens, Mm -hmm. If he doesn't take it, then great. You know, we got rid of our double pawns. If he yeah. does take it, the thing is that then h4 becomes a liability for, mm -hmm. or like an, a distraction for black to have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And in that time, while he's dealing with that h pawn, I can start improving my king. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I would probably play f5 here. Straight up. Okay. But don't you think it's a slightly better idea to, like, instead of sacrificing the pawn, maybe you can get the king and then play f5 or something? That's also something, yeah, that's your, your, your right. Maybe. So, so basically, what I feel is white's king is way too much outside of the action zone, yeah, right now. Right. So maybe we should bring it closer and then try to play f5. If If that happens, then it's, like, very good for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially right now, since we can move it with the, with the tempo on the night, the attack on the night. 
Yeah, so, so that's that's what White does actually. White just brings his king as close as possible. But why did he play c4 and not c5? Does it, does it make any difference? No, no difference. C5, C4, both are fine here. Okay. Okay, so goes king d4. And uh, now actually white realizes yeah, that it's not so easy to like play f5. Because your king does not have a stable square on e4. And uh, the, we cannot really kick the king out of e6 here. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so what next? I mean, so you face the challenge now that you it's not possible to play f5. So what should you do now? Well, we can prepare the f5, you know, with e4 first. Or something uh, like that. E4 first, and then... Hold on. Let me think for a second. All right, so I think that I really need to get this long diagonal here with the bishop. The bishop, I think, is best placed on c3, honestly. Okay. Cutting can... off this thing and, and stopping a bunch of knight moves because anytime the knight moves into one of these dark squares, I'm going to take it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm just going to intuitively put my bishop on c3. Okay, so let's say you put your bishop here and I play knight g8. Okay, so then I'll now can make progress. Like, I don't know, maybe king e4 or something okay king e4 let's so i'll give it to you 97 actually can i take the move back for a second yeah king e4 doesn't really make a lot of sense because i need to really get these pawns rolling i'm gonna play e, uh, e4 instead okay so he still plays 97 okay so I don't decide which way to walk my king. I think the king needs to move around, come come around next. So mm -hmm. I think these these three pawns on uh, on the E and F files are pretty well protected. I don't need to really worry about them too much. Yeah. So my king can now start making some serious progress towards mm -hmm. those two pawns. Mm -hmm. So honestly, I think the best route probably is to go E three. Yes, well done. So this is actually, I mean, according to me also, this is a great idea to now use the king to e3. Okay, black will just wait, yeah? So let's say knight c6 probably. Yeah, I'll get to try to get to g5 if I can. So king maybe like f2. Okay, so I'll just wait. In g3, I still wait. And mm. I will probably still wait. Okay. Mm -hmm. King g5 also, let's say, and I still wait. Ah, now, now you want to push f5, yeah? Um, hold on, let me first think. If I want to do that now, or... If I push it now, though, he could just take it, right? Uh, no, no, I mean, uh, if yeah. knight's black to play, so black has to move somewhere, and then you want to go f5 or something? Yes, sure, that works. In fact, even if it was 
white to, uh, to, to play. Mm -hmm. I think F5 would still have worked potentially because the king on G5 is going to, the king oh. and the bishop, the white king and bishop basically are going to keep the knight from being able to stop that H1. Mm -hmm. So whether that knight is taking an extra pawn on F5 or not, I think I would still probably go for that, honestly. Yeah. As long I think... as I calculate that, you know, the knight is not somehow able to like stop stop the pawn. Well, stop, but also like somehow take on F3 and then try to go and grab H4. But I don't, I don't think he can do that though. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's possible. I think I mean F5 should be winning here. Like, okay, let's let's just say that um so this happens and we play f5, yeah? Like something like this, and we now play start with h4. And keep keeping this in mind, uh, always remember that you don't have to do f5 straight up. You can also play h4 first and then play f5. Yeah? Right. Like gain a That's, move. That makes a lot more sense, yeah. Yeah, you gain a move basically and then play f5. But okay, we will see the worst possible way. And yeah, I think white is winning here because there is no way to attack f3. Um, no clear way to go back uh, unless you decide to sacrifice this pawn, which should be just losing. And now h5, h6 is coming and well, you probably have to sacrifice on h6 with the knight. I will take the knight and like then you play king f5, but I can always play bishop c1, yeah? So white should be completely winning here. Yeah. So I think yeah, this this plan works here. White white actually did something very similar in the game. So white played e4, bishop c3, king e3, and h4. So bishop b2. And here white found a slightly different way to win this one. So white played h5. Okay. So the point was now when you take, I play f5, go king f4, king d5, take the pawn on h5, then you know, then start pushing the king side pawns, yeah. Mm. That's interesting, yeah. So, which looks also pretty simple. So, black tried to get some counterplay with knight here, but it's too slow. And okay, I I, I think um, black actually played king e7 here, knight f4, knight e2, but the knight gets stuck right now in white's camp. Knight might, might be lost, honestly. Yeah, uh, so the knight is getting trapped by force. So knight g4, right. f4, knight e2, king f3, knight e uh, g1, king e3, and the knight cannot get out. Yeah, like this square is taken care of. So even if you go to h3, it doesn't make any sense. And I'm going to slowly now use the bishop. So king d6, right. bishop d4, and... King f2 is coming next. So mm -hmm. king f2, knight h3, king g3 traps the knight. Right. So white didn't even have to like actually try something special to win. But let's just say that black did not fall for this uh, active defenses. Like let's just say black kept uh, king e8, king h5 and something like this. So here, I think the winning idea is still probably the same. We will just play king h6. Um, let's say king e7. And now we can start pushing our pawns, yeah? E5. Right, yep. And then we will play e6, follow it up with f6 if it takes. Yeah. So should be good enough to win the game. Of course, we will probably try to improve the bishop before that, but... Okay, I think many, many ways are winning right now. But yeah, it's it's winning. I can I can even play king f6 and then play e6 as well, which should be winning also. 
So yep. white yeah. white still wins. So so basically, just wanted to say that uh, in in this case, even even though it's on the same side, but since we have these pawn breaks, it's still possible to win the games. Uh, shall we go to the next one? Yeah, let's. Okay. Uh, the next one is actually very instructive. So, okay, I'll still give you some time to come up with some ideas. Uh, how should uh, white progress here? And uh, Rafi, can you give me like a couple of minutes? I just need to go downstairs and get something. Yeah, sure. No problem. Take your time. Thanks. I will be back. I'm going to get some milk rolls. <laughs>
Yeah, I'm back. Okay. So, Sounds good. Could you come up with something? Um, I'm sorry. I was so sorry. I wasn't even looking. <laughs> I forgot that you set up the position already. Oh, okay. All right. No problem. So, uh, we'll explain you a bit in such situations. Yeah, what to do. Um, the the issue of this position is that this square is taken up by the knight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it probably means that we will need our king to go someplace like this and only then make the push to b7. But when we do that, black will have some sort of a counterplay on the king side. For, for sure. I mean, definitely he will have something. Because black is uh, determined yeah, to sacrifice the knight for the pawn once you get it to b7. So, in order to win such situations, uh, like, obviously, this is our main strength of the position, but we will need an additional weakness as well. So, here you can see for, like, in favor of white, these pawns are all fixed on the dark squares, yeah? So, first, what white does, white makes sure that at least one of these pawns still remains on the dark squares. And it starts with h4. So the game continued with g6. If, if black does not play g6, white will play h5 and then take his king. So now what happens yes. is, once this is fixed, black's king has to stay here. Because the moment it tries to create any counterplay like this, we are going to play bishop f8. Yeah? Yes, exactly. So he has to play g6. Then anyway comes h5. And unfortunately, still black king is like tied down to some sort of a defense. So plays king f6, b6, knight b7, bishop f8, king c5. So one might think that, okay, black managed to capture the h5 pawn. But now the other weakness is highlighted by bishop g7. Yes. Right. He has to take this <clears throat> and this. And now white just plays king f2. So how's white going to stop that h pawn? Okay, so black must play something, yeah, right now. So black actually in the game played king f5, bishop g7, h5. So something like this happened. And now white suddenly plays king g2. And it is very interesting to notice that black cannot save the h5 pawn and the e5 pawn at the same time. Okay. <clears throat> because I'm just going to play king h3, king h4, and if you keep the king on g5, I will play bishop e5. And mm. you will run out of moves, yeah? Yeah. So that's how white just won the game. Can you show me the rest? If you don't mind. Uh, I think in the game, black resigned in few moves. Uh, so I the game went with king g5 here, king h3, knight here, bishop e5, knight here, and bishop c7. So this was the Zugzwang position. Uh, interesting. So king f5 leads to king h4. Uh, knight a5 leads to bishop d8 check and anyway king h4. So you you will you cannot defend both the pawns. That's the issue. Uh wow. And this again brings us to the rule, yeah, that if the pawns are like separated by a greater distance, knight really becomes very uh, helpless, yeah, in such situations. So excuse me. Yeah. So so knowing this earlier in the game, when you have options of trading in such a way to where you have these gaps, if you have the bishop, do you keep that in mind, or is that like 
way too far in the future to consider during the middle game and as you uh, approach end game. No, no, we we do keep that in mind for sure. I see. Like I can um quickly show you probably one example where um I had something similar and I kept that in mind during the game. So there was a situation in this uh oh sorry, maybe maybe not this one. Oh sorry, sorry, not this game. Uh hang on a second. Uh, yeah, so there was a game where at some point I had to make a decision. Yeah, so this this was the situation. Yeah. And I, I made a decision to play A5 here. So from, from this moment, I was actually looking at the upcoming end games, like possible end games. And I realized one factor that uh, Black does not have the light square bishop. So obviously at some point I'm gonna pull my bishops back and start playing f4, f5, yeah. Yeah. So the position opens up, and once the diagonal opens up, maybe in the end game I will have something like bishop c8, bishop a6 idea. Mm. And I think the game also like went on something like that. So I yeah, so I, I got that bishop f5 and because of that bishop on f5, uh, his king had to be on b7 for the whole game, which led to some king side advancements here. Yeah? So when he came to defend this, I got bishop c8. Mm -hmm. okay. So I, I, I was able to visualize, like, imagine these things when I decided to play a5 here. I mean, most, most people will like not go for a5 instantly yeah, because it's kind of pointless to close down one side of the board but i i thought that from a completely end game point of view this will be hugely beneficial for me so yeah i mean you can see we can make some decisions based on that as well i mean is a5 the best move in that position or can it also be have been played different ways uh, i have to check actually um because like couldn't you just yeah. leave that there and start playing on the king's side anyway uh probably yeah but that means you have to take care of black's a5 yeah he has this break as well oh he's gonna play it okay okay i mean if if possible so i mean of course i can see that the computer is playing queen d2 which means it's preventing a5 i mean that has to be the only logical explanation mm -hmm. uh but i just want to see if i play a5 is the evaluation changing a lot no a5 is still good So yeah, it's possible. Computers will generally like moves like a5 because they love space, right? Uh yeah, engines will prefer moves as well, like this a5. That's that's also another fact. But but yeah, it's you can see that it's not suggesting a5 instantly. It's actually suggesting queen d2, queen c3, bishop h2, and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Rafi, I think for today we will probably have to wrap mm. up. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, and we can of course meet on the weekend. Uh, just stop the sharing.